Thanks. Um, I want to talk about recent advances in Raman spectroscopy. So before I start, I just wanted to let everybody know what the main scientific drivers are for Hariba. These are the areas that we really push our instrumentation development. So we focus a lot on advanced materials. Um, water. So we kind of call these the mega trends. Um, Haruba has been in water for a long time. Obviously, we started with the pH meter going way back, uh, and obviously that's very applicable to what you guys do at Squirt and uh, the microplastics applications. We make instrumentation for the quality of water too, including some fluorescence instruments. But I'll give you a bit of a flavour towards at the end. Just one slide. Life sciences for the scientific. Uh, segments of Hariba, and uh, we made it five segments, I think uh, Eddie said this morning. Uh, it is very big for us at the moment, especially in biopharma, things like bioreactors and biomedicine, uh, both upstream, so raw materials and downstream, um, the end product. Energy, of course, uh, batteries, big for us at the moment, and also semiconductors. We have a huge semiconductor segment as well. So these are the things that drive our instrumentation and applications development. I'm going to talk day about recent advances, so fast imaging, which will give you a flavor of how fast Raman can go, how you can do very fast Raman imaging, some automation on uh, easy nav, some smart sampling, what we call particle finder, so automated positioning of particles, including microplastics, multimodal imaging, which is adding additional functionality to the Raman system, uh, nanospectroscopy, so going exceedingly small, so down to uh, 5 nanometers, and then some other useful technologies that I think you'd like to see. Uh, it's A-team and dynamic light scattering. I'll explain what those things are at the end of it. What came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> the very beginning of Raman, the instrumentation came first, right? So, wow, we have a cool idea for instrumentation. Businesses get together and we can build this. And then they're like, okay, what should we use it for? Then you start applying it and you find some application needs. Eventually, the application needs outgrow the instrumentation, so you have to develop new instrumentation. Kind of the circle, it just drives each other round and round and around. There's a symbiotic relationship between the application demand and the instrument innovations. The one drives the other and vice versa. These are some of the older instruments driving into new applications, and as we get into those new applications, new needs happen. I'm really deliberately showing the older instruments, but then eventually we get to things like probes, and the smaller instruments, and smaller microscopes. All applications delivered. The one thing that I believe strongly in, in the business development world, is that science collaborations are very critical, and they have to be fun too. That's too short. It's not a fun collaboration. Word. So we're working with Squirt. Uh, with partnering for success in microplastics and hopefully other areas of water in the future. These are some of the driving forces behind what allow different applications to be successful in uh, Raman spectroscopy. So I'm going to turn on my mouse again, hopefully. Find my Got it. Pointer options. Yes, pointer. There we go. So at the very beginning, Raman is actually older than infrared in terms of technology. But then it got very slow in the early days in terms of development. And infrared came along and became the dominant technique. And in recent years, Raman has started to catch up infrared, so it's now an interesting time. Uh, in the early days, different sources and the gratings were developed and they allow uh, the technology to move forward in terms of sensitivity. And one of the biggest developments is here in the late 50s was when lasers first became possible. Uh, and then this allowed uh, Raman microscopes. And we hit an area, some of you may be familiar with uh, surface enhanced Raman for increasing the signal. Raman is a low light technique, so it's always looking for extra light. So if you can get some kind of enhancement from resonance, uh, you can get an improvement in uh, signal, which means you can go faster. Uh, the filters moved on. In the early days, we used to use gratings all the time to filter out the light. So gratings are low efficiency, and you have to pass them through multiple slits. Before filters, you used to use three gratings and throw light away all the time. And then once these notch filters came along, 
they, these allow you to just use a very simple filter to filter out the, the laser light. As I said in my first presentation, getting rid of the laser light that gets back into the instrument is one of the hardest parts. Also in the uh, late 80s, FT Raman came around, and FT Raman got around one of the issues with Raman, which was the fluorescence in, uh, interference. The fluorescence is always an enemy of Raman spectroscopy, except when we use it to help find areas of interest on the microscope. When FT came along, it used a, lot, a laser that's at 1064 nanometers excitation, which avoids a lot of the issues with fluorescence. And this FT Raman revolution kind of got everybody interested in Raman again. And then with the lasers coming along at 785 uh, and simplification and the filters that came along, we were able to make dispersive Raman instruments, which are now the dominant uh, Raman systems, smaller and more sensitive. The 785 got around a lot of fluorescence issues, just like the 1064, because before that we were using 532, so it limited the number of samples you could look at without seeing fluorescence. And in recent times, uh, the technology has moved towards combining Raman with other technologies, like AFM, to get around the diffraction limit. Um, SOARS is known as spatially offset Raman spectroscopy, that's what it stands for, and this allows you to go very deep into samples. So this can actually allow you to look at the brain through the skull. Uh, I won't explain how it works, but you essentially do a measurement away from where you actually uh, illuminate the sample. So the laser's at one position, you collect the light quite a distance, millimeters away from where you illuminate, and uh, that actually allows you to look at uh, very deep samples, and it allows you to look through even very thick bottles as well. And then, uh, you should, I don't know if you can see what this is, but Raman is now actually going to go to Mars uh, in the next uh, decade. So now I'm going to talk about the fast imaging. So what is a Raman image? Oh, on the left, see an optical image uh, with very little contrast because maybe the light was turned up a little bit too much, but there's very little contrast in this pill when you look at a video image of it. If you do a Raman map, make a Raman image, you can see where all the material is in this uh, oh, in this case, it's uh, acetaminophen, aspirin, and it's caffeine. When we do a Raman map, it is a hyperspectral image. You take a full spectrum at each point on the sample, and then from that spectrum, you turn that into a data point. So it can be curve fitting a band of interest, just plotting the intensity of that band, either zero or, or, or weak or full, and then you plot where the material is. This gives you effectively a Raman photograph of the sample. Just to show you what happens in a Raman map. You have a mapping stage that moves to spectrum at each point. Build up this spectral cube. The spectrum goes into the screen as you're looking at it. And you plot out whatever you want. From 2005, so I'm British, so some of you know Doctor Who, um, we have the time warp, okay? So, from about 2005, people started being able to go faster and faster and faster with Raman imaging. It used to be until about then that you could only go about 100 milliseconds per data point. So if you wanted to collect 10,000 data points in a map, which some of these maps required, it was very slow. To give you some example, when I first started with Brooker um, and Renishaw doing Raman maps uh, with the pharmaceutical industry, they would do maps that lasted a day and a half, just the map was a single tablet. So that was obviously too slow, you couldn't get through many samples in a day. Oh, Freeber's incarnation of this is known as SWIFT. It stands for scanning with incredibly fast times. And we scan with about 11.1 .1 milliseconds per spectrum in the, in the first incarnation of this. So it was first driven by a farmer, and we moved but faster, but you can go uh, three milliseconds per spectrum. And when we went to swift excess, we're down to 0.6 milliseconds per spectrum. So you're getting fairly noisy spectrum when you do 0.6 milliseconds per, per spectrum. But what people realized um, in around 2005 is that if you can go faster and you have much larger data sets, you can use metrics and multivariate analysis to pull out the information even when the spectra very noisy. So as long as you have a signal to noise of between 5 and 20 to 1, you can still get a very nice Raman image doing this. 
And one of the uh, technologies that we take advantage of to do this is known as an EMCCD, so it's an electron multiplier charge coupled device. And with that, uh, you get a benefit if you have a signal to noise of less than 10 to 1, you can multiply it by a factor of 10 to 100 and get a much higher signal to noise in your spectrum. The only benefit of an EMCCD is really if the signal to noise is, is 10 to 1 or less. So obviously for very fast maps, this is a benefit. This just compares a measurement on a standard CCD with the same measurement times with an EMCCD. So as you see, as you get below one second on this sample, these were polystyrene beads, you start to see the advantage of the EMCCD. So at 100 milliseconds, when you use the EMCCD, you get a much better signal to noise, and then obviously down at 10 milliseconds, you've got hardly any signal wall with the CCD. But when you use the EMCCD, you can magnify that signal and get a fairly decent signal to noise. So an EMCCD just multiplies the signal without multiplying the read noise. This is another example. If you use an EMCCD for 10 milliseconds per point versus the CCD uh, in this uh, another pharmaceutical tablet, you see the improvement in the quality of the image. So this uh, EMCCD uh, measurement was done with two milliseconds per spectrum versus 10 milliseconds per spectrum on the CCD. So even though it's five times faster, you get a much better uh, image from the signal to noise. With these faster measurement times now, it means that we can also do 3D uh, mapping. So we can do volume plots. Obviously the sample has to be trans fairly transparent, but we can do uh, data cubes, uh, so Z-stack imaging, that kind of uh, measurement. And then the software allows you to essentially slice up the data that you have. Finally, for the very fastest uh, measurements, you would go to something like uh, coherent, coherent antistopes Raman spectroscopy or stimulated Raman spectroscopy. Uh, these are very expensive systems that use two lasers, so it's a pump probe technology, but it actually magnifies the signal of Raman's coming back. I don't have time to go into too much detail. But the reason I'm showing this is because it kind of segues into something else I want to talk about in terms of microplastic sorting uh, experiments in the future. There's a lot of things um, out there on the SRS, the stimulated Raman spectroscopy. If you want to go even faster, uh, and somebody this morning discussed um, whether or not you can do s sampling without actually moving the sample because you need to stick down the, uh, the microplastics. You can actually do Raman imaging by not moving the sample, but by moving the laser beam. So you actually do a raster scan with two moving mirrors. Uh, because you have two moving mirrors, so there's two that move, it's, it will draw a square on the sample. Uh, and you can do point by point mapping using this. Uh, and because you have two, the laser beam, the Raman combines back into a single spot and it's still confocal, so it still goes through the hole in the spectrometer. It allows you to do not only just mapping, also allows you to do some clever sampling. So if you have features that are larger than a micron, you can actually map um, by defining a pixel that's larger than a micron. You can go up to about 50 micron squares so that you don't have to waste time doing small step sizes and missing things. So I think this cartoon works. So you define a pixel that's larger than the, a laser spot size. So it allows you to map over a larger area much faster without missing any data. This only works if the features that you're interested in are larger than micron. It retains the confocality, and because it uses mirrors, it doesn't matter what laser excitation you use, you can still use this methodology. This is very similar to laser scanning microscope technology. Oh, be a little provocative. There is a technique known as flow cytometry, um, and fluorescence activated cell sorting. And very recently, uh, people have been using Raman. Because of this increase in sensitivity and speed, they can use Raman to do Raman-activated cell sorting. So my thoughts are that maybe we can come up with Raman-activated microplastic sorting, which I have now trademarked. <laughs> <laughs> I put that in there just to scare Thermo. Um, but anyway, it's an interesting <laughs> idea. Um, so I, I think this is something we should talk about, uh, Steve. I think it's uh, potentially something that's useful. And I have some slides at the end of this where I, I, I'm suggesting some technology that could be applied to this. But uh, Arman activated cell sorting and fluorescence activated cell sorting exist, and uh, uh, it works very well. 
Uh, they, they use it for uh, collecting uh, cells of the same type and sorting bacteria, that kind of thing. There's a bunch of groups around the world doing this now. Oh, automation. Enough. Enough map. Oh, a couple of years ago, we brought out some technology to help you um, navigate on your sample uh, to autofocus faster and to give you yourself nicer images when you're doing your uh, imaging on the microscope. So these are really microscope functionalities that enable you to do easier Raman microscopy. Well, the first one I'm going to show, and there's a little video here, hopefully it works. Uh, it's just a way to eat more easily navigate on your sample when you have a high magnification objective. So what you do is you capture an image with a low magnification objective and you switch to the higher magnification objective and then you can navigate on the lower magnification objective image but on the higher magnification while that objective is in place. And you can work. It worked earlier. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Here we go. So you see, you move on the, the smaller image, which is a larger area, and you can find air places on that, but you're actually with the higher magnification objective. It just basically removes the need to keep switching back and forth between objectives. And it really does help you locate the right area on your sample. We are gonna practice it uh, during the lab sessions. But that's sharp. It's just a very fast autofocus <coughs> methodology when you're moving on the sample. So if you move to a different spot, the system will just autofocus for you. You have to move relatively slowly, not like you can't be shifting around very quickly, but as long as you move with the joystick uh, at a reasonable pace, the system will autofocus to the best focus position, so you don't have to do that yourself. And view sharp is a way you to the Z stack. So you very quickly do a uh, Z stack video image. So you take a video image at different Z positions on the sample uh, and it saves uh, those images and it knows which part of the Z has the best focus. If you have an image, this, this is actually a composite image of all the best focal points for this Z image, right? So if you just take one, it's out of focus, takes every single Z stack image, it finds the point in the CCD of the video camera that has the best focus, and it uses that image from that Z point on the pixels of the, of the video image, and it uses that image to give you the best focus. So it adds all of those together at different Z points and gives you the image in full focus. It's nice for publications, but it also, it, enables you to have a topology map because it knows where the best focus is. So this is showing you the Z position uh, in a 3D plot of where the best uh, focus is, so you know the topology. So it actually measures the roughness of your sample by just doing this video Z stack imaging. And cool. you have that, it means that you don't have to autofocus as you do a Raman map point by point. It knows the best position. So then you just basically when you move to X, Y, it knows the right Z position, it moves to that Z position very quickly and then takes your Raman um, spectrum at that point and then can overlay spectra and whatever you're using to get your contrast and your image on top of that topology uh, image. Oh, moving to smart, smart sampling, so this is what we call particle finder. No. Yeah. We take a video image, so this is a composite, a mosaic, so the field of view is relatively limited. It finds all the particles using video contrast and it marks them depending on the threshold that you select. It then locates the center of the, each particle and then it will position each particle on the laser beam and take a Raman spectrum of each point. So this example here is on a very high contrast um, substrate, so this is silicon, with nasal spray um, particles sprayed on the silicon. So it gives you a very clear image. So this is a relatively easy sample to use particle finder on. Um, particle finder captures the image of the, of the sample and it, then it 
gives you a morphology of each particle. So you not only save the spectra, you save the morphology, the shape, the size, and you can even save the color. So you then get uh, a spreadsheet of all that information, um, including the position, including the spectrum, all assigned to each particle. This is a little bit more tricky for microplastics. Uh, we've been working on this with Chelsea's group at the University of Toronto. It's proving more difficult than we expected because we're trying to do this on filters. Um, and the biggest challenge we have is this sample here that I'm showing you now is a relatively easy uh, set of uh, particles to analyze. The microplastics are weathered um, and having the right measurement conditions for each particle without having to reset the measurement conditions uh, a little bit more tricky. So we are, are working on this. I'm showing you this because it's the future. It's not something that's easy to do at the moment. Uh, but I do, do believe that we're going to get there eventually. Probably within the next six months to a year, I think that we'll be able to demonstrate this on filters with uh, microplastics. One of the uh, options with looking at particles is sometimes, especially like protein particles, that kind of thing, you get agglomeration. And even with microplastics, you sometimes get particles sticking together. Uh, so you can just go to the center of each particle and take a spectrum. Or you can have the software go and do um, a point by point measurement uh, within, so you can actually then determine if there's two particles there. So you can take multiple spectra. You could do a line across or down or diagonally across the particle as well. It's just whatever you set it up to do in the software. But it's by mapping the particle as well. If you think there's a lot of particles stuck together, you avoid the um, situation where you get one spectrum and you might think there's only one particle there. Automated particle analysis, just finishing this off. So you acquire an optical image. It can be just the field of view that's under the microscope, microscope objective, or you can mosaic and stick, stitch images together. You auto detect those particles, and you save and collect the morphology, size, the shape, uh, even the color. You then automatically move those particles onto the laser beam, and you collect spectra. You then can use multivariate analysis and spectral database analysis to determine what those particles are. Uh, you add to that the metadata of the color, and then you can start using things like machine learning to uh, identify with greater authority and, and uh, the, what each particle is. So the classification can just curve fit, or you can use multivariate analysis. And when we use cluster analysis, if there were like three or four or five different types of particle you think are going to be there, you tell it how many different types of particle you think are going to be there, and it cluster and analyzes them. In, if, if you pick five, it would cluster and analyze into five different uh, clusters. So that just prevents the need to do a live research on every single particle. You can just do a live research on the cluster, uh, so the group of particles. The spectra should be similar or the same uh, in each case. So it just saves you time in terms of the live research. You just live research on the essentially the factor. Just finally, I wanted to highlight a paper I uh, have been the uh, editor for in uh, applied spectroscopy. So I don't know if Steve's mentioned, but we um, the group at Squirt, so Shelley and Steve, and then Chelsea and myself, uh, we are associate editors for a special edition of applied spectroscopy that's coming out in about April or May of next year, which is dedicated to microplastics. And so this group at the uh, University of Idaho, uh, led by John Calabas, uh, and the uh, researcher there is Judy Chabuka, have done some really nice work on microplastics uh, using machine learning. So they are collecting a lot of FGAR spectra of weathered plastics, and they're basically teaching through, they, they use software to teach um, the software to how to identify even machine weathered plastics. So when this comes out, I recommend uh, reading this because it, it enables you to even identify the plastic even after they have biofilms on them and, and, uh, and they're weathered. So it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, piece of work. Two model imaging. So this is where you add technologies together. Um, so you have a Raman microscope, uh, and you can add, as I said earlier today, you can add fluorescence imaging to that system too. In hyperspectral imaging, um, we're adding essentially a UV vis spectrometer onto the microscope. So it's microspectrophotometry, some people know this by, and you combine it with Raman. 
because the microspectral photometry gives you a uh, faster measurement to identify and find uh, materials of interest. Uh, there's other technologies that people add to Raman too, like SEM, or Raman's added to SEM, and AFM is added to uh, Raman as well. It just gives you another mode of, uh, of either imaging or spectroscopy. There are many different methods that can be added to Raman. Uh, so photoluminescence and fluorescence can be added to it, so uh, hydrostatic imaging can be added to it, AFM can be added to it, so you have all these different methods and capabilities for the microscope. So when I say a microscope, I don't mean just the ROM microscope, but the, the microscope itself in terms of the imaging capabilities that enable you to, to have uh, different sets of data that will, should enable you to more and more information about the sample which aids you in terms of identifying and understanding the sample. So in hyperspectral imaging, uh, we take, uh, it basically uses a, a sweeping methodology to very quickly take this UV uh, spectra uh, on the sample. It goes faster than Raman, so you can actually build up a really nice image uh, quite quickly. The system also allows you to do dark field imaging. Uh, it has an enhanced dark field imaging methodology. So in this example here, they take a hyperspectral image, they also do dark field, and then from the dark field and the hyperspectral image, you can identify a region of interest that you want to look at with Raman. Uh, hyperspectral imaging can do larger areas in a shorter space of time, so it helps you identify these regions of interest. You zoom in, and then you do a Raman map image on the same area, and here's your Raman image too. So it's combining different methodologies enable you to enhance both methodologies. Uh, you might use Raman to find an area of interest that you want to look at with hyperspectral imaging, but more likely you'll find an area of interest with hyperspectral imaging that you then do Raman on. Uh, hyperspectral imaging is very useful for finding particles, very useful for uh, things like nanotoxicology. Uh, they use it also for things like SIRS, when they're trying to deliver SIRS to, low, to cancer areas of a, of a cell. Uh, and then they image to find where those first particles are, and then they follow up with the uh, Raman imaging. Moving to the hypoxicology, um, with hyperspectral imaging, it enables you to find the major areas of interest uh, with very little sample preparation. Uh, and then they can also do the, so the enhanced dark field enables you to find the areas of interest. The spectral measurement with hyperspectral enables you to uh, see more contrast, which then helps the Raman, uh, and then you do the Raman to get an exact identification and uh, location of nanomaterials. And then with both, you can do the, map, the spectral mapping uh, to get your image uh, and overlay the images on the same sam sample area. This is an example of that here. You have a, essentially a video image here, and then you have the hyperspectral imaging, and then you can enhance that by uh, uh, taking out the areas that you're not interested in. And this is basically the, the uh, hyperspectral image data. So you don't get much uh, ability to identify uh, material using hyperspectral image. It really is a, is a methodology to get uh, better contrast quickly on a sample, to do very fast imaging and to enhance your, your contrast. Um, and then coupled with Raman, you then get the identification through the Raman. <coughs> now nanospectroscopy. So, Eddie mentioned this morning, um, a little while ago, he uh, acquired AIST. Uh, so AIST was the company that he was working at before he joined Haribo when we acquired them. So this is combining AFM with Raman. This is very interesting for looking at very small particles uh, and very small areas on samples. It's used a lot in 2D material analysis. Um, I'm showing this uh, because we've been doing some work uh, with emission testing and also break particle analysis. So emissions go into the uh, uh, atmosphere and then they can agglomerate in the atmosphere and then they come down and they're deposited through um, weather, weather uh, that kind of thing. Common enables you to look at one micron or down to about a half a micron at best. With AFM, you can look down to about one nanometer. Wow. So by combining the two, you can use AFM to find areas of interest, but you can also combine AFM with Raman to do what's known as 
hip enhanced Raman spectroscopy. This enables you to do Raman spectroscopy of a sample size that is down to about five nanometers and 